welcome everyone to this Aga Aga um, launch. My name's um, Nigel Ward. I'm from I'm associate director of platforms at the Australian Biocommons, and I'll be chairing this session today. Um, great to see so many of you here today virtually. Um, before I introduce the the um, agenda and speakers, I'd just like to acknowledge <clears throat> the Turbul and Yagara people as the traditional owners and custodians of the lands from which I'm presenting to you today. I know we've got people from all around Australia here today. Uh, we recognize, uh, on behalf of the organizers of this webinar, I pay my respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognize their valuable contributions to Australia and global society and science. In terms of what we've got in store from, for you today, we're going to hear from three speakers about who provide some background about the Australian Reference Genome Atlas. We're going to see a demonstration of a preview release of, of Arga, and then we'll leave some time at the end for some questions and answers and discussion about what we've what we've just seen. So to kick, kick us off, I'm going to throw to Dr. Andre Zerger, Director of the Atlas of Living Australia, who's going to provide us with some background on the NCRIS collaboration that um, has led to the demo you're about to see, and an overview of why the Atlas of Living Australia is interested in AGA in the first place. So over to you, Andre. Thank you very much, Nigel, and I guess everyone can hear me okay. Great. So as Nigel said, I'm the Director of the Atlas of Living Australia, and um, I just wanted to mention, I guess, that um, this project uh, or this initiative has been a collaboration um, under the NCRIS program, the National Collaborative Research Infrastructure Strategy um, that is supported by the Department of Education and the Australian Government. Um, it's primarily um, a partnership between Bioplatforms Australia, BioCommons, Australian uh, Research Data Commons and the Atlas of Living Australia, all with slightly different interests and uh, contributions to make into this space as well. Um, and I know there have been many, many other teams involved in this, um, particularly, for example, groups that have represented the steering committee and the science committee. So we're grateful um, to that contribution. Um, the INCRIS program is a research infrastructure program. It funds some of the more significant research infrastructure that supports the science community in Australia. And increasingly, the NCRIS projects um, are working together more. Um, the program's been around for about a decade, uh, or just over a decade, and we're seeing kind of a convergence of capability, um, which is fantastic. And I think what we're seeing in Aga is that convergence where three or four projects for a number of years uh, were working reasonably independently. Um, but we're now starting to realise the benefits of data integration. And I can't think of a better example of that than where Arga's heading. Um, from an ALA perspective, um, this is really interesting and exciting. Um, we've historically been focused on mobilising data, biodiversity data from biological collections, research institutions, state government departments, um, really taxonomic data. Um, from those collections. Um, we've added an environmental perspective to that. Um, we index our 125,000 species occurrence records against environmental parameters from generally spatial layers around bio, um, climatic parameters, terrain parameters, uh, even a suite of geographic parameters um, like um, IBRA region, state boundaries, et cetera, to essentially value add to that core data. And, and clearly what ARGA does is takes us one step further into the genetic space, um, which is really important. I'm sure Sarah will touch on that in a minute. So alongside advanced imaging and imaging and the kind of basics of a species occurrence record, we're moving towards realising the concept um, that's being promoted internationally around something called a digital extended specimen. So really a complete digital digital representation of a physical specimen um, of biodiversity. So ARG is going to play a pretty key role in that. Um, probably my last two points really is um, what 
Catherine and the team will be showing today is a minimal viable product. It's a prototype. It's not the final product. It's there to support um, user testing, um, giving it some knocks, testing it, and improving it over the next 12 months. And that's a really important process. So there's a caveat there. Um, and probably where I'll end is I'm really impressed that Catherine and the team are planning to demo this live. I would never. Um, I'll pass to Sarah. Thanks. Thanks, Andre. Yes. Yeah, so, so next on the agenda is uh, Sarah Richmond, General Manager of the Science Programs from Bioplatforms Australia. And Sarah is going to discuss how Arga was conceptualised and how um, it might be used by the research community. So over to you, Sarah. Thanks, Nigel. And thanks, Andre. Great introduction. Um, I apologise for not presenting to camera. I can't quite get my slides to be on my main screen without it pausing. So I'm going to be looking in this direction. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the, I guess, origins of um, Arga and what that kind of um, where that started and where those concepts originally came from. Andre's just given us a great overview of the ANCRA state of play and there's a number of facilities here and we're all starting to collaborate and work closer together under, in, under increasing need for multidisciplinary research and science. Bioplatforms Australia, for those in this room, as many of you, so there's probably a lot here who don't quite know who we are or what we do. We're the ANCRIS enabled provider of life science infrastructure, and we invest in instruments and expertise in genomics, proteomics, metabolomics, and most recently synthetic biology. And we support the use of all of the fantastic things these fields do um, through a national uh, bioinformatics investment called the Australian Biocommons. This, we support a bunch of facilities across the country. And I, I wanted to put this in here to give you an idea of scale of the genomic research that's happening just within, uh, I guess, within our, our umbrella, which across Australia is just one small part of it. There's lots happening. Last year alone, um, our facilities in this image uh, serviced around 20,000 individual contracts and almost 50% of those had an environmental agriculture focus. So that's quite a substantial amount of uh, researchers, industry, people generating genomic and other omic types of information to answer research questions in environment and agriculture. And these facilities uh, form a really large connected network of shared cross-disciplinary expertise. We then deploy this capability into what we call kind of national framework initiatives or national data initiatives that support prioritised challenges across human health, agriculture and food and biodiversity. These initiatives are really focused on building those large scale reusable reference data sources and building Australian scientific capabilities within those. So we've got a bunch of initiatives that we kind of pull together for sort of um, concentrated efforts of activity, but together they all form part of a strategic response to delivering omic data uh, for Australia's native and agricultural species. And it's super important to mention that we are by no means the only people doing this. There are a whole wealth of other domestic efforts generating referential data, as well as a number of international programs that are working across uh, Australian species as well. So we know that there's a lot of genomic and other omic data being created, and we know that that data has a really significant impact on various areas of, of um, national priority. So all this data really, really matters. And it underpins data-driven decision-making for many of these priorities. It enables, as an example, it enables proactive responses to assess biosecurity risks that may impact our economy and our environment through applications of things like eDNA surveillance. It helps provide insight into disease virulence and therefore management and mitigation of those diseases. In conservation, it supports decision-making through fundamental understanding of population diversity to inform breeding and translocation programs, to boost our success in recovering threatened species or ecosystems. It forms an important piece of the puzzle that is all focused around enhancing productivity of our food systems and our contribution to global food security. 
Um, and genomic resources enable the discovery um, of genes and functions that can be leveraged in medicine and energy and food and other agriculture components. So there's a whole wealth of impact that genomic data has as an important piece of the puzzle um, for addressing these national priorities. So the challenge, oh, sorry. There's a whole lot of data um, and we know that that's being created here domestically, but also internationally, but it is fragmented. There's a number of different databases that these data sets can go into. And given how much Australia is home to such a large number of native species, many of which are endemic and numerous species or, or subspecies thereof are farmed in Australia, including animals and plant crops. Um, and genomic data for these species exists and is publicly available and stored in all of these kinds of databases, some well known and others obscure. At the beginning of all of our framework programs, we do a big national audit of what data already exists so that we can prioritise gaps and so that we don't duplicate any efforts. And we often have to search through a mul multiple databases, all of which have different search capabilities, different taxonomy structures, different metadata, ontologies, um, and different data access mechanisms. So this was this is a very extremely time consuming process that we undertake and we often miss existing data and that's just the work that we do and we know that um, this is a true problem across all academics and researchers working in this space. And while many roads, it's worth noting that while many roads lead to the big international repositories like NCBI, we've found that actually many also do not. And this is particularly true for certain data types and for unpublished data hosted by institutions such as museums and herbaria that uh, where that data is incredibly important. So missing the discovery of an existing data set means we unknowingly duplicate efforts and waste resources, which can be super scarce in areas such as conservation. We know that discovery is one hurdle and the next is access with different data repositories requiring various levels of expertise to download data for analysis. And even if the international repositories did indeed index all the existing genomic data across the globe, there's currently no easy way to understand the breadth of this, these genomic resources that's available through a lens of species that are important to Australia. Finally, part of the forming this challenge is as we move further into innovative fields such as comparative genomics and the challenges that are associated with that, we really need to ensure we're enabling access to the quantum of data required to unlock the potential of that field of science. So we developed the concept for the Australian Reference Genome Atlas. Um, and the initial intent was focused on providing an index of all genomic data stored across the globe that is tightly tuned to species of, of concern to Australia. We wanted to make sure it had a faceted search to enable filtering via functional traits or characteristics such as threat status, habitat type and so on. And these are some initial mock-ups that we did. The real Argo looks much more sophisticated than this, but this was sort of our concept brief. Um, we also wanted to make sure Arga had a focus on exposing reference genomes as the primary data set, but we wanted to make sure it also had the ability to catalogue other relevant data, not only in omics, such as barcodes and other omics, proteomics, metabolomics, transcriptomics, um, as well as raw data, but also important um, data such as what Andre spoke around occurrence records and other environmental data layers. Importantly, we wanted to make sure we went beyond discovery and access at, to going into use of data and being able to download that. So we wanted to ensure that there was function to find 50 different reference genomes, export them to a cart and have kind of a one click download or a one click export to an analysis platform such as Galaxy. So once we kind of developed this concept, we realised that here in Australia, as Andre touched on, we have the infrastructure and the expertise here to achieve that. And that's why and where we started the Arga program. 
we set up an advisory group to help provide use cases and shape key functionality that you'll see today. And at the end of the day, we really hope while, while we know Arga will be of use to a broad spectrum of researchers, including those interested in finding all of the available omics data for a single species, we many of the sort of driving use cases have centered around comparative genomics and how accessing and analyzing large sets of genomic data will help inform really important questions such as understanding what genomic adaptations have allowed a broad cluster of Australian species to thrive in diverse and challenging environments such as deserts and rainforests and arid regions things around understanding invasive species and what genomic features contribute to the success of invasive species in Australia and how we can use this information to manage them. Um, functional genomic variations exist in Australian amphibians and how do they impact their biology, ecology and adaptation to local conditions. So these are just some of the examples of the questions that we hope researchers will be able to come to Arga do a search using some refined traits or characteristics and then access that data and launch into kind of a new comparative genomics research question. So all of this has led us to the Australian Reference Genome Atlas and really we hope this is a platform that's tuned to Australia's species of concern where you can discover, search, curate and export data to support Australian research priorities. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Sarah. So with that background on the NCRIS collaboration, NCRIS capabilities that are, have helped produce Arga and some of the, the scientific and government missions we hope it, hope it will support, and a bit of an example of the, the thinking that went into the mock-up beforehand, I'm going to pass over to Catherine Hall for the main event of the day, where Catherine's going to, Catherine is the Arga product champion She's going to walk us through how, how the team has responded to that context, what they've done to build Arga, and be brave enough to show us a live demo of how those mock-ups have actually been, been realised. So over to you, Catherine. And after that, uh, we'll have some questions and answers. Over to you, Catherine. Thank you, Nigel. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you so much, Andre. I am so pleased that you've uh, beautifully set the scene for me. And I'm also very grateful to you, Andre, for explaining that this is um, an MVP, it's the minimum viable product. Um, we have been able to integrate data and put it together. And that's what we'd like to show you today. And also, um, as a lot of the um, requests in the original mock-ups that Sarah had, had made. Um, I hope you'll see we've been able to implement a bit of them and there's um, a lot of room and um, ambition for the future for us to integrate more and more of them as the product grows over the coming 12 months. Um, it has been my absolute pleasure to uh, be the product champion and product manager for the Australian Reference Genome Atlas project. And I have been fortunate enough to work with a really great team of um, developers and also some business analysts and UI specialists who have helped with the um, conceptualization and putting together of the Arga product that we'll be having a look at today. And I'm so grateful to them and um, thank them very much for all of their hard work. Um, as, as we've seen a lot already, this project has, what, and I think what has been so great about this project is that it has been a true partnership. Um, our team itself is built from um, people who are employed directly with the Atlas of Living Australia and people from the Australian BioCommons. And together we have worked with BioPlatforms Australia um, and also some with some um, investment and input from the ARDC in terms of um, assistance with data uh, structure and vocabulary building for us to to put together Arga and I just want to acknowledge them here. So when we set out to um, after we received the brief on on what to do with Arga, um, Kiva our, our business analyst um, went out and set about talking to the community to find out what they would really want from um, uh, from a platform like Arga, um, if it were able to bring together all of the data, what else would they need to know um, beyond that? And so she 
we talked with 98 people from 38 institutions around Australia and they ranged in their specialisation from um, people who were focused on biodiversity and taxonomy but we also made sure that we spoke with people who were working actively in the conservation space as well as in biosecurity space. So some of those um, economical and in ecological, um, ecologically important areas for Australia. And we asked them direct the direct question, um, if you had lots of data in one place, what would you want to know about that? And so the things that they told us that they wanted to know and understand about any data that they found were that they wanted to be certain of the taxonomic identity of any of the pieces of data they were um, looking at. They wanted to know the quality about that data. And they also wanted to know that there was enough metadata there for them to be able to understand how it had been derived. So the provenance of any data that they were looking at and also um, whether there were any other pieces of data associated with it. So um, any sort of network of, of information around any particular piece of data. So with that in mind, we spoke to our tech team and we put together a, a list of potential things that we could do with Aga and we cross-referenced that against how complex it would be and whether or not it would actually address any of the problems that people were wanting to have solved. I won't go into the detail here, but just um, be reassured that there was a lot of thinking and detail that went into the planning of the steps that we were going to implement in Aga. And with that in mind, we devise, set about devising a solution that was going to resolve the taxonomic uncertainty question. And the way we planned on doing that was to use the national species lists and the Australian Faunal Directory as well as primary resources for the names, which is exactly what the ALA does. And so we partnered, uh, we do the same thing as, as that. And also we wanted to be able to include informal taxa or manuscript names that very often a lot of genomic data may be stored under in places like um, NCBI GenBank. The other thing we wanted to be able to provide for users was um, some visualisation so that they could just briefly look at raw data, not interact with it too deeply, but just enough to assess for themselves whether or not there was, uh, so it's not an analytical platform, just visualisation to know whether or not those data were of good quality. And then also in terms of the metadata, we wanted to create and force links with the existing occurrence records that are um, demonstrated and shown in Atlas of Living Australia through places like OSCAM and the Australian Virtual Herbarium, which collect and aggregate the occurrence records from museums and herbaria. And we wanted to then demonstrate the collection history and the accession history of those samples from which the DNA data have been derived. So the other thing that we wanted to do as well before we commenced work in earnest was to really get a good handle on the data space that we were working in. And uh, this is a very complex diagram and um, we don't need to worry too much about it uh, and each one of those leaves on the tree other than to recognise that Genomics data aren't genomics data. So there are lots and lots of different types of data and each of them can be used in a different context and to answer different specific types of questions that researchers might have. The other thing that it was important to understand was that those data are actually actively generated from an individual specimen. So um, a sequence comes from a specimen, it doesn't come from a species. And that was really important because the specimen from which a sequence or a piece of data has been derived may not actually be the owner of that species concept, which is known as the holotype in taxonomy. And so this species then represent aggregations of each of those specimens which have been put into a species based on the um, considered view of a taxonomist or a, or a worker in the field. And so we needed to represent all of that within our model. So we realized very quickly, this was a very big and complex challenge. And so we needed to devise a model that was firstly going to respect that those data themselves are hierarchical. And somehow we wanted to convey that to the user in an easy to understand way. We also needed to integrate data that was coming from a number of different sources and it may be stored differently and it may actually be different in its essence. Um, we then needed to make that interoperate with all of that rich biodiversity data. And so we chose to standardize and unify the whole lot under what we knew was working and aggregating things well in Atlas of Living Australia, which is Darwin Core model. And so we, we used um, all formats. So we used um, that as the premise for going forward 
to combine all of our genomics data with the biodiversity data using uh, a schema that relied on Darwin core formatting. So um, just very quickly, I will explain that what we wanted to represent was that um, there is a specimen and it may or may not have been subsampled multiple times, maybe once, maybe many times, uh, from which DNA has been extracted and then amplified and that has produced data. So there was this hierarchical structure that we had there in terms of the actual specimen. And then we wanted to be able to capture in our model the way that it has persisted in time and space, um, and as well as the different actions that may have occurred um, to each of those uh, material samples. And so we divided up um, these events based on what was actually happening. Um, and so we looked at actions that may be done to an actual physical specimen, like you collect it from the field and then you put it into a museum collection. Um, then other actions like subsampling it and extracting DNA from it, and then amplification and sequencing. And then we had a whole lot of other um, additional steps that related to the data itself and how it was specifically being treated in terms of the sequence assembly, whether the annotations that were happening to it, where it was deposited and when. And we also wanted to build in, though we haven't got much data at this point um, for it, we wanted to build in a data reuse event so that we could also then begin to start capturing how any published data were then being reused in future studies to understand the impact of any data that were being created um, and how useful they were um, they were and whether they were actively being used to solve any problems. So the main point of this is not to get too hung up on, on the complexity of the model, but it's to understand that um, what we really want to do is be providing users with really strong provenances for, for each of those data, pieces of data that they want to interact with and show that um, over time, um, different steps may happen. So someone may generate some sequence data, which may then be annotated at a later stage and so on and so forth. And we wanted to build that in with a model that was flexible and also extensible um, so that as we added different types of data, we could append them and paste them in at the right um, point along that trajectory. Um, that's just a close up of it, which we don't need to focus on too much. Um, and I'll just show you just a little bit to um, how that would work in effect was that we've created an event. And to that event, we then paste some other and append some other um, information which in the example of a specimen which has been collected in the field, it would be the location and the um, organism that it was, as well as an identification for that. When it moved into the museum, then it may have been re-identified, so we may have another identification block. And so we can link the two events together that way. Um, what we've done later on when we've looked at subsamples and DNA extracts is we've been able to extend and alter and change the blocks that we put in. So that um, depending on the actual action being performed, we can show different facets of the data. And it's uh, very tailorable and very flexible. But as amazing as that all sounded and we felt very happy that that was going to actually capture some of the reality of the way in which the data were generated, we ran up against a big problem, which was that the different pieces of data that would fulfill that provenance chain um, are actually needing to be sourced from different places. And that means that they end up being in different formats. So for instance, the collection information and the accession information, as well as sometimes subsampling information, is often information that's held by museums and it's stored, or herbaria, and it's stored in uh, Darwin Core format but the information relating to the amplification and the data a sequence assembly and data deposition may be stored in a database like NCDI GenBank or BioPlatforms Australia portal, and it will be in a different customised format or a minimum information for a, a piece of sequence information standard, which is different. Um, we also then wanted to add in other information like protocols potentially um, or data reuse. And then that would be being driven from a, an alternative location like publication, which would be in yet another format. So we needed to, uh, and I um, 
likened this to trying to knit something out of steel wool and spaghetti. Um, one cuts the other one very much and it makes your jumper fall apart. So in order to, to make this work, um, we used the, um, there's a, a block of DNA derived data extensions that have been developed by GBEF and they align very nice and uh, nicely and work really well with the Darwin core information. And so, we used the, uh, them as a starting point and made unique mappings for every one of the repositories that we were looking at um, to check whether their data would align with these fields. And we pre-processed it so that we could then add it in to create a what we call the Darwin Bot Archive. Um, if any of the fields we wanted to display didn't map neatly, we brought them in as just verbatim data. So they were just in the format that they are and not necessarily aligned with one of those other um, fields that have been pre-identified. So we then aggregated them against the, the taxonomy that we had, which is in the Darwin Core format. So now it would all talk nicely to one another. And we enriched some of the um, the species names with um, additional identifiers from GBF and worms so that we were able to bring in information that was pre-coded for us about whether or not um, organisms were marine or invasive or terrestrial and various other facets like that. And then we, um, another aggregation that we performed was we harmonized our specimen numbers to the occurrences as well. So we went through the data that might be in NCBI or in, in bio platforms to look for any specimen numbers. And we then map them back to um, occurrence records that we already have within the Atlas of Living Australia. So with all of that in mind, um, I just want to affirm again that this was a very complex space that we were working in and um, we devised a model that was based on our learnings from looking at 74 potential databases that we had a look at, um, each of which has its own nuances and subtleties and idiosyncrasies. Uh, for 16 of the key ones of those, we have developed um, mappings of the, the fields and meta, uh, metadata fields that they have in them. Um, and made them ready for ingestion. We have now ingested the bioplatforms data, the NCBI GenBank data, and barcode of life data, and made them interoperable within the Arga app itself. Uh, at this point in time, we're proof checking um, a few of the things from bioplatforms because we want to make sure it's absolutely right before we let you loose on it. And we have also ingested biodiversity data in, in Darwin Core. So we've normalized all of the genomic data to be able to interoperate with that. So with that in mind, I'm going to show you enough fuss and I'd like to show you live what we've done. Okay, um, so when you arrive at Aga, this is the, the Aga interface, um, you'll see you're greeted immediately by some summary information and it will let you know straight up that we've indexed 80, nearly 88,000 species um, as being relevant in Australia. There are a few more um, there that are in Atlas of Living Australia that, that we haven't captured just at this minute point in time. Um, and of them, 800 are known to have a whole genome assembly. Um, additionally, there's 2,800 which have got um, some form of genetic or genomic data associated with it. You get a leader, which is um, perhaps unsurprisingly a Arabidopsis, uh, which is a model organism very often, and it's got a whole heap, 183. But um, the leaderboard here is led by um, plants, and we can see that they are crops, um, solanum, rice, corn, um, and so uh, that's what's where the the obviously the the greatest amount of um, active genomics research is going on there. And then there's one animal, pig, that's made it to the bottom of the leaderboard. Um, this is dynamic and will update as we index more and more data. Um, so when you get here, you would probably want to search for something. Um, we've also created the provision for people who might know where they want to begin to be able to look through something like whole genomes and just browse and see what actually has a genome. Um, you can see there's some lovely fish, um, some wattles, um, a sea star there, a crown of thorns, and you can filter this then you might say, I would just like to look at mammals, please. Um, and you can filter and facet that 
based on that and it will bring you back then a list of the mammals that have got a whole genome and there's a, a seal and some antikinus and things like that. So that would be one point of entry. Um, if you were going to go back here and search for data, you might say, I'll chance my arm, I'd like to feel lucky and I will look for a shamrock maybe today. And uh, the three-leafed clover here, trifolium, has got two genomes. So I will have a look at that. And I'm taken to a view where it's immediately showing me how many genome assemblies are known and some basic summary information about that. And I can see that there are two genomes, but they are at different levels of assembly. There's just um, one, which is a contig. And then here I have a full, very large, compared to this one, very large whole genome. Uh, at the chromosome level of assembly. So I might like to have a look at that and get a full view of that. And it provides me with some other information about it and lets me know what information has been indexed and is available here for us to have a look at. Um, I might like to get that data, which I could do here by going directly to the source. Alternatively, I could add it to a list um, and save that for later on and have a look at that. Uh, if I were doing, um, I might want to look at some, some other information that might be available here, say for instance, um, what's going on with some genetic components for which here there's none in this example, but here there's some um, other sequence data and these are plant barcoding genes. I might look at where the data are distributed. There's no data that's relevant from Australia in this example, and it's all coming from Europe over here. Um, I can also get a taxonomic summary as well. So I think in this example, I'd like to do a comparative study. So I might then click on the genus and go back and browse and see what is available for the whole genus. And I can see straight away that 13% of the species within the genus have got a genome. So of the 39, there are five. Um, and this one, Trifolium pretensi, has got the most. So I will have a look at it. and look at its genome assemblies. And here I can see that there's another full genome here. If I were to look at it, I could add it to the list again. And I could similarly look and investigate at what other pieces of data were available. And here I might like to have a view um, of one of these genome markers. And here I can browse and have a look and see that there is a high quality sequence there, which is nice. Um, and so because that's nice, I might like to interact with it and take that, that one. Um, I can then go back to browsing again and pick maybe a third species, or I could simply take the option here of browsing through all of the species and pick any of the ones that had a whole genome. And in this, I think I'll look at this one and look at the chromosome assembly and add it to my list again. That would then generate a list for me here like this that I could use. So that's one way in which I might be able to take a tour through the data that are on Arga. Um, I'm tired of, of clover now, so I want something Australian. I might look at a platypus. And in this example here, we're bringing back um, a number of species that have got platypus in their name, but I also know here that this is the monotreme, Ornithorhynchus, and it has five genomes, which I might like to look at again. And here I can see that there is one representative genome, and there are some chromosome level assemblies, some scaffolds and other things. I might want to look at all of those so I can browse and say, show me only chromosome level assemblies. And I can cut the data that way to focus on the ones that I want to look at. Um, I think I want to look at this one. So I will do that. I've seen some basic information. And now I think I'd like to know more about this specimen. When I go to a specimen view, um, in this example, which is coming from NCBI, there's no information about the collection event. But what there is, is quite a lot of data available about the amplifications and sequencing and the sequence assembly information. So if I scroll down and look at those, I can see here in this first event, 
here, a scaffold was, assemb was uh, assembled. And then if I go to the next event, I can see that it was renamed. And in the third event, I can see that the chromosome level assembly was created at a much later date. Then, years on, and then I can also see in this fourth event, in November 2020, it was designated as being the NCBI RefSeq. So in that way, I can see the history of this um, piece of data and how it's been developed and, and deposited within GenBank. So I can actually see the different interactions that have occurred with, with that one um, genome assembly. Another thing I might like to be able to do in here is I might want to look up, um, say, a feather glider or something like that. And if I were to do that, I could come here and look at the feather glider. And I could see that there's a, a contig level assembly. And similarly, I can look at genetic components. And in the example for the gliders, there's a lot of exon kits which are available within bioplatforms that I can see. And on the map, I can see their location. Um, there are no single loci for these ones. And I can also see some information about the distribution of this species. Um, if I were to go and look at Pitorids for doing a whole, I might want to do a genomic um, revision or I might want to do a comparative study based on all of the Pitorids. I could come back and see that um, the species that have the most are Dactylocilla and Gymnobolidius here. And I can go and look at them and interact with them again and look at their assemblies. And see there's a contig there, which I might like to view and add to my list. And if I were to browse again, and choose another one, I might say, well, there's just simply too many for me to know which ones I'd like to include in my study. So I might like to apply an ecological filter of some type, and um, I might like to see what was vulnerable to wildfire. And so now I've learned that Pitoris is, Australis is vulnerable to wildfire. So I'll have a look at it, and there's a contact level assembly there, which I could similarly add to my list. And in that way, I could build up a set of um, sequences that I wanted to interact with based on not only its taxonomy, but also um, some ecological filters related to it. So um, that was just a really quick tour through um, the things that we have implemented in Agra at the moment. We're very ambitious and greedy and would love to do 101,000 things for you. Um, but the key first thing we'd like to do is integrate a few more of those 16 data sets and help with pushing the data through to a platform like Galaxy. We want to do some more enhancements around the filters and traits and also some visualizations. And I can show you what we have in mind to add to Aga. We've created a lot of lists um, from verified sources. We've used some indigenous ecological knowledge filters driven from the ALA profiles. We have created filters for uh, lists of marine status, terrestrial status, um, also some commercial applications like agriculture or managed fishery, fisheries, as well as uh, documenting the Australian um, threatened statuses um, based off government lists from the various departments federally and, um, and within each state and jurisdiction. We've also incorporated some um, information about venomous species, edible species, medicinal species, pests, invasives, crop well relatives and migratory species, as well as native things. So we think they might be useful cuts for you to come and browse through um, what does and doesn't have a genome there. We'd also like to implement um, an institution-based search for you so that you might uh, want to say, I'd like to see all of the things that are in the Australian Museum and know how many have got genomic data. Um, and you can do that via the institution or perhaps even by um, any collection that's housed within there, like the fish collection, and see that um, a certain percentage of those have got it. Um, another thing that we think would be useful is to interact with people's ORCID IDs um, and see who has submitted genomes and also who might be submitting biodiversity data um, and see what percentage of those data were being reused and, and how they were being used so that people can come and track how their own data are being um, shared and utilised. Um, 
So the other thing I'd like to say is at the moment, um, we would like to invite you to come in and write to us at contact at argot.org.au and Kiva or me will um, interact with you to set up a time to look at your specific use case. Um, say for instance, you're doing a study on snails and you'd like to know what data are available, something like that. We could walk you through how you would be able to create your own search within there. Um, or if you have any other questions in general, you can write to us at contact at arga.org.au. Or well, actually that page is also available via the, the homepage for the project at contact, arga.org.au slash contact. Thanks, Thank Nigel. You. Thank you so much, Catherine. And congratulations to you and the team on, on navigating a really, well, thanks for your motivation on, on explaining what a complex space this is. <laughs> thanks and well done to you and your team for navigating and producing a prototype that um, implements a lot of the mock-ups that, that um, Sarah showed earlier. So well done to everyone. Let me give you a little clap. Thank um, you. Thank you, team. <laughs> I'd like to open it up for comments or questions. If you have any, could you just please raise your hand in Zoom and that way I can um, ask you to speak. Excellent question. Um, I am so pleased that I have a, a fantastic steering committee to help advise me on this. Uh, we have got uh, the catch-all term Australian relevant, um, which is, is gives us a little bit of wiggle room and, and it's a bit of a weasel word, but um, it allows us to, to be a little bit more flexible beyond just including um, only native species because we wanted to be able to include migratory species and things that, and also things that were of direct relevance for biosecurity purposes and things like that. The other, of course, obvious thing there with um, any sort of generic um, or genus level or family level reviews for phylogenomics might be that you would want to incorporate some Australasian species and Papuan species and things like that. Um, we can index things in the background globally and choose whether or not we display them. And so we've implemented um, our Australia relevant filter over the top of that um, based off a backbone list. So we could add additional um, ones to that list if it, if there were a, a, a justifiable reason for, for incorporating that group. Um, for instance, we have got penguins in there because they're in the Australian Antarctic Territory. So um, we, we, we have a little bit of um, flexibility and control over, over what we're able to display. But the lists um, were defined based on said the national species lists. Um, so that was the Australian Plant Census and the Australian Faunal Directory, as well as the, the fungi list and the algae list. We're not including bacteria at this point in time or viruses either. That's another fantastic question. We've got a schedule uh, um, that we've been creating. In terms of something like NCBI, we would be aiming to do that every Sunday night uh, and to, to do catch that every week. Um, for other more niche or maybe more slowly uh, growing databases, um, we would do that. Um, we, we have a rank uh, that we've created internally. Um, something like, for instance, reef genomics, we might only index that every six months because we don't see a lot of movement. We haven't seen any movement over the last 18 months. Um, but we've created ingestion scripts and pipelines so that um, that can be done and it can be done on a scheduler. I might inject one, which is that, uh, Catherine, you were, you were showing the the... the... The, the massive data model and the range of fields that you created in that data model. But as you were showing, some of it can be quite sparse. Do you think there's an opportunity to influence how the data is described? I truly hope so, Nigel. Yes, it's something that, that we've observed when we've been putting it together. Um, that I think there's a lot of scope and fruit for people to come and see that this data would be of use. and um, Therefore, it would be of greater benefit when they're depositing data to try and include as much as possible, seeing how it can be actually used and spliced in together um, and, and different permutations that be, can be created based on, on how much you actually put in um, at the time. So I really hope that, yeah, it does start to encourage people to see the value in storing their metadata in a way that we can index it. That would be fantastic.
absolutely i would i would love to take it in that direction i think that's a brilliant idea um we know that on genomes on a tree there is a displayed some information about whether an assembly is in draft status or something like that, which we, we are hoping to be able to reflect as well. But I think this is an even better idea. So you know who's actually got the specimen or who's doing the, the workup. Um, yeah, if we were able to access the information or people were to supply it to us, I, I think that would be something fantastic to, to have us represent. Um, and I think it, it sort of highlights and, and goes back to Nigel's previous question as well, which is where there are these gaps, um, we can hope to, you know, encourage people to, to start to contribute more. I mean, there's a really simple example there of where if there's not an image for, say, some sort of tapeworm or something like that, um, which we don't have um, easily to hand, if people just wanted to upload that to us and send it to us, we'd be really happy to share that. Um, if there were some protocols that weren't captured within NCBI, but they knew that it was generated in this way, they could also backfill that um, via a place like us as well. We're not a data repository where we are an indexing service, um, but um, I think it would be fantastic for us to, to actually work with the community and, and capture a lot more um, bits of information along that pipeline. Absolutely, It'd be fantastic. We'll email you. <laughs> well, I might wrap it up there in, in the interests of time. First of all, I'd like to thank all of our presenters today, Andre, Sarah, and Catherine, and thank the team for developing the product that Catherine was able to demo live bravely. Um, and I'd just like to reiterate Catherine's call to action at the end of her presentation that if you do want to get involved in understanding or influencing AGA, please reach out to contact um, information on the AGA website. We'd be more than happy to talk to you. So thanks everyone, enjoy the rest of your day.